Hello everybody and welcome to this module on moral distress. My name is Michael Dunn, I'm an Associate Professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. In this module we're going to be looking at uh, moral distress from a different range of perspectives. I hope by the end of the course you'll be able to do a few things. First, understand what moral distress means, how to analyse it and to consider the various scenarios in which it can arise. We'll also be identifying who can experience moral distress and we'll recognise the personal, interpersonal and structural causes of moral distress and how some of those causes can be managed or mitigated uh, in healthcare practice. So there are four topics to cover within this module and each video clip will pick up on one of those four parts. We'll start out quite broadly looking at the concept of moral distress itself and I'll also introduce you to some ways of thinking about conceptual analysis and how we specify the correct forms of concepts like moral distress. We'll move on then to talk about a particular scenario in which I think moral distress is present and we'll think about an initial diagnosis of its causes, its features and its effects. In the third clip, we'll move on to look more fo in a focused way at the various implications of moral distress, its features, and who is affected by it and in what ways they're affected by it. And in the final clip, we'll turn to practical strategies for managing moral distress and how we can mitigate its effects, negative as they tend to be, in day-to-day -day practice. Okay, so in this first clip, we are turning to the question about what is moral distress? And we're going to look at the concept in the round and its heritage, how it's developed in the literature. And I'll also introduce you to some methods of conceptual analysis, ways of thinking about concepts to try to justifiably specify what the precise form of moral distress is. And we'll get to two conceptual accounts of moral distress, a narrow and a broad account. And I'll try to uh, argue that the broad account is the one to be preferred for healthcare practice. Okay, so analysing moral distress. I think when we think about what moral distress is, we are immediately motivated by two analytic steps. First, I think it's right to point out that moral distress is a concept that aims to capture a particular state of affairs that by and large affects healthcare practitioners and possibly other people as well. The first step in our definitional work around moral distress is what does it mean to define this concept? How, for example, does moral distress relate to mere distress that hasn't got a moral component to it? How do we qualify distress in ethical terms in that sense? And the second step is a normative one. It's a sense in which when we invoke the concept of moral distress, we are called to action as practitioners healthcare providers or managers of healthcare services. So why is that? Well, I think it's partly because the identification of moral distress suggests there's something wrong with our current state of affairs that we should do something about. That is to say that we ought not to be in this state of moral distress and that someone who is experiencing moral distress ought not to be experiencing that. So how do we understand and explain the wrongfulness or the bad things about moral distress and then once we've identified what's problematic about it, what should we do? So the conceptual and the normative sense in which moral distress is relevant, I think, to our ethical inquiries. Okay, turning now to conceptual analysis, I want to give you a brief uh, overview of the methodology of conceptual analysis to try to help you think about specifying and defending any particular account of moral distress that we could give. So the idea here is to say that when we're looking at concepts like moral distress, to be able to account for it, to say what it is, we've got to be defining it in its broad sense of the term. We've got to be able to specify its conditions, its components, uh, and be satisfied that's the correct account of that concept itself. So the aim here in a sort of analytic sense is for linguistic precision, that the specification of our concept is correct, essentially. What we're trying to do is, is define the concept of moral distress or any other concept in ways that capture its essence. 
In a sense, there's also a real world check on this exercise. Does the way in which we account for the definition of moral distress chime with the everyday way that people use that or the way in which the discourse around it in a healthcare setting or in academic discourse has progressed or is used most commonly? Most importantly, when we're defining concepts like moral distress, we should be avoiding mere stipulative definitions, that we just choose ourselves what that term means and expect other people to use it accordingly. Very famously, um, Lewis Carroll in uh, uh, Through the Looking Glass uh, criticised through Humpty Dumpty's use of words the problem with these kinds of stipulative definitions, and I'll put that on the screen for you to digest. But the idea here is that words have meanings that we can commonly use and defend and that we're not in the business of simply defining them on the way that we think they should be used or meant. There's, not, there's no authority to kind of stipulate our own definitions in that sense. In, uh, okay, so that, we'll move on to, the, to, to, to think about why that's important. So if we take the Humpty Dumpty approach of just saying, well, words will mean whatever I want them to mean or concepts mean whatever I want them to mean, the danger is in understanding how we can come together and agree the common and shared uses of a term. I might simply not accept that you've captured the meaning of a concept in the right way. So the danger here is that we speak at cross purposes. You describe moral distress in one way, I describe it in another. We can't even communicate or understand each other when we come to use that term. Or when we implement it in practice, it will remain uncertain or troublesome in its usage. We'll develop methods that derive from different conceptual accounts or we'll be enacting the concept in different kind of ways because of different preconditions that we have about the meaning of that phrase. So analytic precision, conceptual definitions and, and defending the precise meaning of concepts is an important task in healthcare ethics more generally. And of course we use these concepts all the time, moral distress, concepts like futility, best interests. We can always ask, how should we properly define that concept? Now, a dominant method in the analytic tradition in philosophy and applied commonly in medical ethics is to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions of concepts. So the idea here is that we adopt a kind of, self, a way of logically thinking through the specification of a concept that probes the conditional relationship between different statements. And this is an important uh, strategy I think to deploy when we think about moral distress because in the literature looking for necessary and sufficient conditions has been the dominant way in which people have tried to make progress in telling us and accounting for the defensible and proper use of that concept. So I want to just introduce you to this idea of necessary and sufficient conditions before turning back to moral distress and how this might apply in that concept. Some worked examples of this kind of method of conceptual analysis. Let's take the concept travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. A general concept, we could specify anything we want, but that's a general idea. So the idea here is the process of travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. Someone is trying to define what that idea means. And they say this, leaving one's home in Singapore defines travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. Now what that person has done is they specify what I take to be a necessary condition. You can't travel to Malaysia from Singapore without leaving your home in Singapore. It's necessary to do that in order to travel to Malaysia. But importantly, it's not a sufficient condition. We've got to do other things other than just leaving our home in Singapore to fulfil the requirements of the concept of travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. For example, we've got to get to the border, we've got to take a flight, we've got to move between countries. So we'd say, that if we try to define travelling to Malaysia from Singapore by reference to the, co to the condition leaving one's home in Singapore, we've specified a necessary but not sufficient condition for that concept. Now let's turn it around, look at what a sufficient condition might be for that definition of that concept. Let's say, take the claim that to travel to Malaysia from Singapore, one must take a flight from Changi Airport to Kuala Lumpur Airport. Now I take that to be a sufficient condition for the concept of travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. It's one way where we would sufficiently fulfil the conceptual requirement. We, we, we travel to Malaysia from Singapore by taking a flight from Changi Airport to Kuala Lumpur Airport. But importantly, it's not a necessary condition of that concept. 
because of course there are other ways that one could travel from Malaysia to Singapore that don't involve taking a flight of that kind. So neither definition fulfills the necessary and sufficient conditions for the concept of travelling to Malaysia from Singapore. That's the kind of idea of how we think these things through and we try to identify both necessary and sufficient conditions. Okay, so as I said, one way of defining and justifying a concept is to identify both the necessary and sufficient conditions for that concept and rejecting definitions that only specify the necessary but not sufficient conditions or vice versa. So the concept of a bachelor might commonly be defined as, as, as following. A bachelor is an unmarried male person. Now, I take it that that is an unproblematic definition of that concept. It's a good conceptual account. Because being unmarried and male and a person is both a necessary and sufficient condition for being a bachelor. You can't be a bachelor if you're not an unmarried male person and there is nobody else who would count as a bachelor but the unmarried male person. So we would defend and justify that account on those grounds. So back to moral distress after that methodological interlude. What does the concept of moral distress mean? Not as easy as we might first think. Here's a few possible definitions to think through. Moral distress is a state of psychological distress people experience when facing a moral dilemma. Moral distress is a state of psychological distress people experience when they cannot do the right thing. Moral distress is being in a general state of moral uncertainty regardless of the psychological impact on the person. Moral distress is a state in which a person is unable to sleep at night because of the responsibility to make difficult ethical decisions. Is all of those accounts, are all of those accounts, accounts of moral distress? Only one of them, a number of them? That's a question I want us to be thinking about throughout. And I think one way we could answer that is by turning to our method. Which definition captures both the necessary and sufficient conditions of that concept? Now we'll come back to that definition, those, those, those conditions in a minute, when we look at two rather distinctive and different accounts of moral distress. And I take these to be the dominant ways of reviewing and, and, and synchronising the literature in, in some terms. The original account of moral distress came from the 1980s and worked on in nursing ethics, and it's a rather narrow account of the concept of moral distress. So Jay Maturney in the mid-1980s argued that moral distress is the following. When one knows the right thing to do, but institutional constraints make it nearly impossible to pursue the right course of action. What can we say about that definition? Well, first, it locates moral distress as a product of problematic institutional, structural or political arrangements. It locates the problem in the system that prevents us from doing the right thing. It emphasises distress as manifesting in psychological, emotional, physiological terms. And it emphasises challenges relating to moral judgments and constraints rather than wider moral dilemmas or moral uncertainty. So we are judging what the right thing to do is and we are merely unable to act on the basis of our judgment. It's built around a core feature of moral judgment in that sense. There are other worries about this concept we might have. For example, the use of the term nearly impossible. What does it mean for something to be nearly impossible? How do we define near impossibility from impossibility or possibility? It's vague in that sense. Now finally, it's worth pointing out that most of the work on moral distress, and particularly the case here, I think, in this definition, comes from the nursing ethics literature rather than, for example, the medical ethics literature. And for many years, it's really in the context of nursing practice that moral distress has been thought about. OK, I want to move now towards um, what I take to be a statement about a broader conceptual account. This comes from a, a review of the literature, I think, that, that maps out a progression of understanding of moral distress 
that breaks away from that narrow original definition that I just introduced you to. In a sense, it's a, it's a product of multiple ways of new, of new ways of thinking about moral distress in the intervening 25 years since the Jameson piece was first written. And Georgina Morley and colleagues conclude that moral distress is as follows. Moral distress is a phenomenon that emerges when A, or one, one experiences a moral event, and two, when one experiences psychological distress, and three, where there is a direct causal relationship between the experience of a moral event and the experience of psychological distress. So it's a sort of conditional relationship of, of, of interweaving uh, conditionals in that sense. Why is this broader? Well, it basically starts by saying that the Jameson's, form, the Jameson's original formulation was problematic and too narrow on the basis that moral distress really has been used much more widely in common practice and discourse than that narrower sense of moral judgment and inability to act on constraints suggests. In particular, what Morley and colleagues argue is that there are many different scenarios in healthcare practice, broader moral events as they call them, that give rise to psychological effects and distress that are not merely limited by the fact that one is constrained from acting in the ethically correct way. So they want to broaden it out and uh, break free of this link to uh, the institutional constraints on moral judgments and the enactment of moral judgments. The core objection, back to our conceptual analysis and their attempt to refine the concept in broader terms, is that Jameson's account defined a sufficient but not necessary condition for moral distress. It only went so far, essentially, in helping us to understand this concept. Yes, the Jameson account is, 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 a, is a correct and sufficient account of moral distress, but it's not necessary. To, to be in the situation that Jameson describes to be experiencing moral distress. There are other elements to one's experiences that could also count as moral distress. Okay, so what do Morley and all uh, say in more detail? Well, the first thing they do is they try to broaden out this idea of mor to, to, to what they call a moral event. They, they look at the trigger, the kind of starting point, by referring it to a much broader set of, set of experiences or considerations than this mere focus on the constraints imposed by, by moral judgment, on moral judgments. They take the use of the term moral judgment to be ambiguous. It can capture lots of different elements of ethical decision making or ethical practice. And so they review the literature and identify a wider range of moral events that they think can trigger so-called moral distress. They include the following kinds of things. This is a non-inclusive uh, list, I think, in their own terms. They say that moral events could include moral dilemmas. That is a situation where there are two competing and equally strong ethical obligations that both cannot be met. The classic case where we have competing values, for example. Or perhaps a situation where the patient's values are at odds with the professional's value commitments and we can't enact both, uh, both, both approaches. Secondly, moral uncertainty. When it's unclear, when there's conflict in practice between different values, how to weigh those up and judge between them. We're in a state of moral uncertainty. They think that could also be part of the definition of moral events that give rise to moral distress. Thirdly, problematic moral climate. This is quite similar in many ways to what uh, Jameson was getting at with this idea of institutional constraints on judgments. But it takes a slightly broader account of the social context of judgments and says there are lots of ways in which our social environment could impact on our moral agency, setting in place the wrong kind of climate for moral action. Fourthly, internal personal constraints beyond the mere social or institutional, that as a professional, I could be, be doubtful within myself, I could lack assertive qualities, I could have problematic individual socialization or be perceived to be powerless in my own actions in the context, all of which are a moral event of concern that could produce potential distress, counting as moral distress. So the source of moral distress can sometimes be, in their view, very, in, very personal in character rather than institutional social in character. 
Um, and finally, they draw attention to potential circumstances of epistemic injustice in a healthcare professional context, where, for example, a particular professional, for example, a nurse, might find that they're unjustly excluded from having input into a medical decision or be unjustly denied a role for their expertise in making uh, ethical judgment or perhaps just in general day-to-day -day medical practice in diagnosis, care planning, etc. All of those would, would, would meet the criterion and their view for epistemic injustice and therefore count as a moral event, it could give rise to psychological distress, that would count in terms of the concept of moral distress. Okay. What about the concept of psychological distress, which is one of the conditional components of their account of moral distress? They don't have a lot more to say about this than Jameson does, other than recognising, I think quite broadly, that psychological distress is a, is a psychological feature, it's, a, it's an effect on one's mind and potentially on one's body physiologically, and that we, have, we can have a quite a low bar to what counts as distress. Um, and it's obviously experienced as a negative emotion in that sense. So they have an awful lot more to say about the experience of moral dis uh, psychological distress in, in trying to define the concept. Now, one of their worries, and this is a common feature in the literature about moral distress, is that actually there's been a, an overwhelming focus on the presence of distress rather than moral distress, such that we often get to a point where whenever a healthcare professional is distressed, we'll conclude they're also morally distressed because of that presence of distress. And Morley and colleagues are also a little bit worried about that conceptual slippage as they see it in the definitional work. So that gives rise, I think, to their third condition, this causal, direct causal connection between both the moral event happening and the psychological distress experienced. Better, they think, to understand psychological distress as a necessary but not sufficient condition of moral distress. Which essentially means that if a healthcare professional experiences moral distress, experiences psychological distress, that would have to be experienced to count as moral distress. But not all experiences of psychological distress are rightfully called moral distress because they're not caused directly by moral events in the sense in which they try to link those two elements. Okay, thank you very much.